Um, yeah, why don't we start with your personal involvement in politics and how you came to know about the beauty of cumulative voting. The uh, way that I got involved with cumulative voting and uh, my interest in government, which has been a lifelong interest, was because my father was a town clerk in Joliet during the 30s and to the mid-40s. And during that time, um, for a personal reason, because they thought I was a bit shy, and uh, so the family and the doctors they took me to decided that I needed to meet a lot of people to get over my shyness, my father would take me to his office during these days. And in those days, the town clerks in the, around the state of Illinois were the people who were the offices where people applied for poor relief. People were in desperate economic circumstances in those days. And my father used to interview those people, and I used to hear people's stories being told to my father about their need for government help. And there wasn't a whole lot of help in those 30s when I was quite young and growing up. And I would hear their stories, and then I would hear about my father getting together with other uh, people in township government and go and plead with the state legislature, plead with the local legislators to help those kind of people with state programs. Uh, there were no federal programs to speak of at that time. Franklin Roosevelt was trying to get them started. So I became very interested in what government can do for people because of the, that personal arrangement with my father. So I watched, uh, I watched people in tears trying to get a, uh, a voucher to buy a ham, for example, to feed their family for a month or so. Uh, vouchers where the Bogardus Relief Fund would take them into uh, grocery stores where they could get food. So I became very interested in what the possibilities were for government, what they could do. As you became more interested and saw what was going on, I also found that the area I lived in, the legislative area, was at that time Will and DuPage County, one legislative district, one senator, three representatives, and we had cumulative voting, and one of those people would be a Democrat. And that was the person my father had to go to because the Republicans were opposed to this kind of uh, government assistance at all levels. I mean, and that's not a partisan matter. That's the Republicans are still proud of that, I think. But I found that, that that's why I became a Democrat. That's why I became interested. That's why I found the possibility of cumulative voting and what it would do. The only Democratic legislator that anybody knew in Will and DuPage County in those days was old Joe Sam Perry, who later ended up on the federal bench, nominated by Paul Douglas. We had a state senator, Republican, who served for 48 consecutive years in that district from 1902 to 1950, opposed all of these measures. My father was a friend of his, had coached his sons in boxing, but couldn't get him to support any of these welfare matters. We also had no reapportionment of legislative districts until the time of Paul Douglas and so on, and we fought for that back into the 60s before legislative districts were reapportioned and they changed the representation. So you had some, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> some districts had as few as 10,000 people where they had a senator and three representatives, and some had 70 or 80,000 people. So <coughs> cumulative voting still provided the best opportunity to get voices in Springfield to listen to people in need, and they helped change the state. And the voters rejected people in the more marginal districts, the legislators in the cumulative voting areas. And then some thoughtful Republicans would get elected in some districts. For example, the head of uh, uh, the state FLCIO, his son was elected as a Republican from the Streeter LaSalle area. Uh, he couldn't have been nominated without cumulative voting. Carl Soderstrom was his name. And he then was in the Republican caucus and said, we have to change. We have to go along with some of these things. We have to support Governor Horner and so forth in these uh, pleadings that were coming from the township officials. Uh, because they had no tax base, because the tax base, people couldn't afford to pay the property taxes. Until a sales tax was enacted in those days, the state was levying against property. And that was horrendous because, you know, people were property poor. People were losing their farms, their homes, and so on, because that was the only way they were getting money to support state government. It wasn't until Governor Ogilvie's time when this courageous Republican was able to get enough Republican votes in the legislature to pass an income tax, which is a, you know, nobody likes to pay it, nobody likes to pay any tax, but it's a far more just tax. If we didn't have that, <coughs> property taxes would be 20 to 50 percent higher than they are now, and they're already a, a scandal because of their unfairness. 
So <clears throat> cumulative voting, and that's how my interest in it began. And then as I went to school and learned detail about it, <clears throat> excuse me, I went to the University of Notre Dame. And ironically, there was a, one of my favorite professors of all time, an extraordinarily interesting man, by the name of Ferdinand Hermens. Ferdinand Hermens had been in the Bundestag in Germany prior to, well, he was there when Adolf Hitler, you know, started and got himself and his, the Nazi party, into uh, power in Germany. And he had a thesis that uh, proportional representation, which is a, cumulative voting is a form of that, was a very bad thing, according to him. And he and I used to joust on this matter. The reason he thought it was a very bad thing is because the system in Germany led to a parliamentary proportional representation system, led to a multiplicity of parties. And he felt, right down to the marrow of his bone, that without a multiplicity of parties, Adolf Hitler could never have gotten control of Germany governmentally. Because the election that Hitler quote unquote won, he only received 13% of the votes, his party. But then he went in when they were choosing who was going to be the chancellor in this parliamentary system, he, he browbeat all the people in the legislature to do it. They didn't have a single elected uh, effective uh, leader, and that made all the difference in the world. Well, I said, well, we have a president here, and we have a governor, so we, our, our, you know, the executive body is headed by one person. So the legislative body isn't involved in the executive body per se. We've got this separation uh, in the branches of government that doesn't exist in a parliamentary system. So I kept wearing him down and wearing him down and wearing him down. By the end of the year, and I brought him all kinds of information from Illinois and what the prospects were, what the election results had been, and I finally wore him down and he said, well, I guess you're right. And, and in Illinois, it will work uh, to provide uh, government and it won't lead to a multiplicity of parties. It might lead to an occasional independent candidate, but it won't lead to other parties. One of the problems with a multiplicity of parties is you divide uh, uh, government and you don't really provide a way to get uh, you know the great majority of people represented when you've got fringe elements controlling the thing you have to come to a majority conclusion but you do need thought going into that and that's where cumulative voting comes in people who are willing to take a chance and test the system and make the people who are in the system already pay attention to important developments to change and that's where cumulative voting comes in in my opinion I hope I responded in an appropriate way to that uh, 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 query. Okay. Um, I knew I'd get... One of those questions was that DuPage County question, if you could just yeah. explicate that for us. I knew I'd get Ferdinand Mendes in there somewhere. Yeah. You're, yeah. You're yeah. Your favorite. No, I wanted to hear that. He was amazed when he found out he finally ran into somebody who personally knew of Ferdinand Mendes. He'd read about him, but he'd never heard about him. Okay. The Maybe. guru. <laughs> Why don't you ask your question about... He keep so tell about us DuPage. a bit about um, the development of DuPage County, what it is, and... Uh, how cumulative voting helped it? Well, for example, in cumulative voting in DuPage County, <clears throat> back in the uh, 40s, I remember when my father used to officiate football games there, DuPage County had 40,000 people in the 1940 census. And DuPage and Will were one Senate and House district, if you will, electing one senator, three, three members, uh, three House members. But as DuPage County grew, of course, it had always been because of the nature of the uh, people who uh, settled there and resided there because of the affluent nature of the county. They tend very much to be Republican in nature. They tend, I think, to be m moderate and conservative Republicans, and there are a lot of Democrats who live there because of philosophic leanings in spite of their affluence. They still are Democrats. There are some working people who live there and want to support Democratic candidates. Um, Cumulative voting, and DuPage, as you know, is just west of uh, Chicago, just beyond O'Hare. The ends of the western ends of the runways of O'Hare are in DuPage County, across York Road and th that part of it, and uh, the towns of Wheaton, which is the county seat, and Glen Allen, and Downers Grove, and Hinsdale, and Addison, and Bloomingdale, and uh, I referred to Henry Hyde. He now represents the northern portion of that in Congress. And, uh, of course, you've got a big congressional race going on in the other part of it, in the 13th Congressional District, uh, two women vying to succeed Harris Faywell. But uh, you will find that uh, cumulative voting had a grave impact, great impact. That's where Bill Redmond, Democrat, Speaker of the House, came from. The current Republican leader, who was the speaker in the last session, is from DuPage County. 
It's the body where the largest concentration of Republican legislators comes from in the Senate and the House because of its size and uh, so forth. And uh, it's gone to, it's over a million people at this point in time out of the uh, roughly 12 million in the state of Illinois. So it's the m biggest county outside of Cook. Um, what were some of the drawbacks of cumulative voting? Well, the real drawback of cumulative voting occurred from the, under the old constitution of 1870 when the parties could nominate, one party would nominate two and the other party would nominate one and there was no contest for people to choose from in the general election. That was a tragic situation. Now independents could have filed, but <clears throat> now today, since the party circle has now been eliminated, an independent would have a chance under that system, but they didn't at that time because of the way the votes would fall. And the straight party circle provided so many votes to the Republicans and so many to the Democrat, but then it was all over. There were no split ticket voting to speak of in the, in the early days. And uh, <clears throat> so that was a tremendous uh, problem. But Mayor Daley, uh, Richard J. Daley, uh, mandated through his power in the Democratic Party in Illinois, the Democrats would nominate two in every district. And then I believe when it came time to adopt the new constitution in 1970, I believe that it was a, a mandated in, uh, in the constitution that, that would be, there would be four people nominated minimal to choose from. So um, would you say most of the main drawbacks would be uh, you know, minimized if parties had to nominate two? Sure, if you, have, if you were required to have four nominees minimal in the election, and that I think turned out to be the practice if not specifically the law, certainly that presents the voters a choice that they could zero in on and use their three votes to bullet vote use that opportunity to say this is an outstanding person and he ought to be there no matter what the party bosses of the two parties say. We can go for this person and that person now has a chance in a general election and a chance in the primary to win. And that's the real key to cumulative voting and what effect it can have on changing government to the good. And the other point I've made is the Illinois House is the launching pad for all the other people who get elected to the Illinois Senate to Congress from the state and, of course, to the state constitutional offices. Um, I'll ask one question about that. Whether do you think cumulative voting helps create a more bipartisan atmosphere rather as opposed to the current House? Um, so do you think cumulative voting created a more bipartisan or more partisan atmosphere in Springfield and why? Cumulative voting in regards to its creation of a bipartisan atmosphere has to be looked at a bit differently. And what you have to look at is, again, back to the caucuses. Bipartisanship comes when the people around the state have said through election process, we're electing people who are responding to this issue which you've been ignoring. And this is what cumulative voting allows. The bipartisanship occurs when they decide, well, we have to uh, put something together here that the people want, that the bulk of the people, or we're going to be punished as a party. So bipartisanship is not a matter of coming together in the, uh, in the House from a cumulative voting standpoint. However, the current system, without cumulative voting in the Illinois House, has so polarized the raising of money and so polarized the, the situation, whereas you, know, you have, of the 59 uh, senators, there are probably, first off, you're only electing half of them each year, every two years. So 28 races or whatever you've got, uh, 29 or 30. So you're going to have a problem there because, uh, you know, you, you have lesser number, but they're only a district or two, and that's largely when an incumbent chases. Incumbency has advantages because of raising money and all the things that incumbency gives. But a House campaign without cumulative voting, you have the same problems, but you've got a narrower district and it really allows, you know, people to get control of that seat. And what has happened is that uh, uh, Speaker Madigan, former Speaker, now Republican Leader Daniel, uh, the President of the Senate, Pate Phillip, and the President of the, uh, the, the Democratic Leader in the Senate, uh, Emil Jones, the people who give money, the large bulks of money that come, they control it. The individual legislative candidate can't raise money from the people who ordinarily give money even if they are philosophically or legislative tuned, legislatively tuned in, unless permission is given by these leaders. That didn't occur before cumulative voting was uh, eliminated. 
So that's a big difference at the present time. And I think that's the main reason why if a proposal is put on the ballot and the people are properly informed, they will reinstitute uh, cumulative voting in the state because right now the polarization has been caused by the money. Money is, in the words of the famous uh, old speaker uh, in California, uh, the mother's milk of politics. And the money has been taken out of individual candidates' hands for raising it. They have to go on hands and knees sometimes to their leaders to get it. When you have to go to on hands and knees to somebody to get your money, then when he asks you for a vote, you really don't have a free vote anymore. And as a result, you're not really representing the people. You're not representing good thought. You're not representing good government. You're not representing the future. You're not talking about the real sound issues of how are we going to fairly fund the education of our kids? How are we going to fairly fund the needs of the hungry and the homeless in this state? These are serious matters that people really want dealt with. This is what the citizens want dealt with. Not the matters in terms of, you know, what is the pension program for this uh, particular group of public employees? or what are the contract level going to be in this state, but this is where the money comes from to fund the campaigns, not from the people who need the help, and not from people who need a fair, just tax system. We're losing that in this state. I mean, you know, everyone knows that the funding, uh, state funding of education has dropped from 48 to approximately 30 percent, and uh, uh, attempts to uh, reform the process by you know, even Jim Edgar, a late come to the battle, his own party turned their back on him because of the pressures that came on the leadership who never allowed a vote to be held in the Senate. Never allowed a vote to be called in the Senate. Passed the House, didn't pass the Senate, and I submit that it was fundraising that was at the base of that whole thing. How does cumulative voting help solve that money problem? Because you're going to get a different kind of legislator in both the House and the Senate. As I repeated, I will say again, the change in, in cumulative voting will provide a base of legislator that isn't going to wear the collar of the leadership like the current legislators do, unfortunately. And some of those people are friends of mine. But I know from them, frankly, the collar's on them. They, they are beholden to the leaders like never before in the history. And you do not, you don't have the farm system for the Illinois State Senate. So what you have are people getting elected over there who are still under the collar of the fundraising capabilities and the power that presents to the leaders of the legislature. Explain and when the governor of this state, his own party, turned their back on him, wouldn't help provide votes to do, I happen to agree with his position, I happen to agree it was right, and it took some courage. He spent 700000 of his campaign funds to try to promote it. They turned their back on him. That's what's happened. That never would have happened under days when you had cumulative voting and you had a system for bringing good people up to the Senate from the House. Explain to me how cumulative voting led legislators to be free of the leadership. How does cumulative voting lead to freedom from the leadership? The reason is because voters, they can go and they can beat the primary process. They can get into it because people can vote three votes for one candidate. The issue-oriented candidate, without a lot of money, can get a group of people together, and in a legislative district under cumulative voting, you'd have anywhere from two to 300 precincts. That's not an enormous problem to handle for people who are you know, involved with an issue. You get an outstanding man or woman to run in those areas, get on the issues and deal with people, they will turn out to vote for those people. They can give them all three votes and say, we're turning our back on the party uh, people who are coming up. We're being promoted because they have done work in the precincts, carried water for the elephant or cleaned up after the donkey, as it may be. They're going to have a chance to get through this maze of the process. First off, because we have primaries where you have to declare an affiliation, and secondly, because of the money. You can win in areas like that. They've won, be you know, Abner Mikvah, people like that, Paul Simon. They beat those systems in the past. Once the system changed, we no longer see that type legislator. We don't see them anymore. Um, that's it. Yeah. So let's give it anything. Let's, yeah. What we do, we close out with, okay, we've been hitting you. Anything you want to say that you haven't said uh, or, you know, some kind of summary that you want to make? I mean, it can be nothing. That's okay. Too. I think it's nothing. I've, okay. We've, well, we've kind of covered this yeah, ground. Yeah. Okay, great.
recording. Okay, so if you could say your name and whatever title we should put underneath your name. My name is Don Clark Netsch, Professor of Law Emeritus, Northwestern University School of Law. Um, you are a delegate to the 1970 Constitutional Convention. Could I you, was, go ahead. Could you please tell us a bit about how cumulative voting played out at Constitutional Convention? Well, in the first place, uh, I think people have to get it into context. At the time that we went into the Constitutional Convention, we had a system that was absolutely unique to Illinois. We elected three members to the Illinois House at large from every Senate district, and we used something known as cumulative voting. Uh, you had three votes, both in the primary and in the general election. You could spread them out, uh, all three to one candidate, one, one, and one, or one and a half, and one and a half. And uh, it, it did all kinds of interesting things, which I assume we will be talking about. So that's the way we were at the time of the 1970 convention. There were a lot of people in the state who thought that was a terrible system. And so obviously how we elected members of the House was one of the major issues in that convention. A very controversial issue. And indeed it was one of the four issues finally on which the delegates, as it turned out wisely, decided to give the voters a choice. In other words, when we sent the convention or the Constitution to referendum, at the end of the convention. We presented a full document, and then on four controversial issues, we said, you decide the voters. Uh, one of them was how we select judges. One of them was the 18-year-old vote. One, believe it or not, was the death penalty. And the fourth was, do you want to continue the system of commutative voting, multi-member districts, or do you want to go to single-member districts? And the voters at that time chose to continue cumulative voting and multi-member districts. So it was indeed a very major issue at the time of the Constitutional Convention, and one in which there was a great deal of difference of opinion. <coughs> I'm sorry, this is going to be a... <coughs> you can cut that part out. <coughs> I assume. Well, the forces for were uh, primarily of, of um, sort of two categories. One was the Chicago regular Democrats, uh, who were a very, very strong force in the convention, of course. Uh, and the other was, interesting enough, the independents, uh, who were primarily from the Chicago area, or Chicago and suburbs. And uh, the reason why independents had always been for uh, cumulative voting was it's the only way independents had ever been able to break into uh, the machine pattern. Um, because they were able to, the expression was bullet for a candidate. That is, when you've got three votes, uh, you can give all three to one candidate. And that often made it possible for uh, a non-regular organization Democrat to be nominated. And once nominated, a Democrat was always elected in Chicago in those days. Um, so uh, it was a, just an article of faith among independent Democrats that cumulative voting was uh, the be-all and end-all. It was sacrosanct. Uh, I came out of independent democratic uh, politics, and I went to the convention assuming that I would be a strong advocate of cumulative voting. Um, I spent a lot of time uh, during that whole process sort of rethinking the process, um, uh, the system, and looking at the results over a period of time, and decided that Probably if I were writing a constitution from scratch, I would go to a single member district. So I changed my position. <coughs> Sorry, can, if you can, can <coughs> I, yeah. uh, that if I were starting from scratch, uh, uh, you know, thinking of the long term of the big picture, I would probably start with single member districts, which of course is much more the traditional uh, American way. And so I became an advocate then of uh, single member districts. One or two of my group, uh, the, the independents in the convention, uh, uh, went that way. But most of them, of course, were strongly committed still to cumulative voting. Uh, the other group that was a very strong uh, single member advocates were what I would call the, um, the sort of independent uh, uh, downstate and suburban Republicans. Uh, those who didn't come out of, who were Republican really, although we were all technically elected on a nonpartisan basis, uh, but uh, who came out of 
not uh, a strong organization background, um, you know, like the DuPage County Republicans would be today. Uh, people like um, John Parkhurst, uh, who was in fact a state representative, Republican, uh, a very fine representative uh, from, um, uh, from the uh, Rock Island area. Um, Peoria, I'm sorry, I said Rock Island. Uh, um, John would not like that. And, and several of the uh, uh, League of Women Voters uh, members from suburban areas, uh, because the League of Women Voters had been a strong advocate of single member districts for a long, long time. Um, so that's sort of the way the, the forces lined up. And uh, in the end, uh, I think it's probably fair to say that we made a trade-off. Uh, we agreed to put both of the issues of single member districts and cumulative voting on the ballot for the voters to make a choice. And in return, we insisted also that we get a chance to have merit selection of judges versus elected judges uh, on the ballot as a separate choice for the voters. So both of those things went out for the voters to make their decision. And um, as I said, the voters chose to stay with cumulative voting, I think primarily because of the um, Chicago vote, probably, uh, because the Chicago regulars uh, were strongly for keeping the system as it was. Um, then, a few years later, um, I went into the Illinois General Assembly, actually into the Senate, and although I had worked with the legislature before, so it was not as if it were an unknown quantity to me, uh, but I saw it probably in a different light, uh, even though I was in the Senate, which would not have been affected by cumulative voting, but I saw the difference between the Senate and the House. Now, bear in mind, I was elected in 1972 to the Illinois Senate, and um, uh, we still had cumulative voting up until, well, actually the 82 election, and uh, there is no question that, that things were different. Uh, uh, and the thing that's important that I think has you know, got me sort of reassessing my position uh, and willing to participate in a reassessment now is that, for example, uh, you had Republicans elected from the city of Chicago because of the cumulative voting, the bullet voting technique. And in many cases, they were um, what I think we would all call quality legislators. I mean, people like Elroy Sandquist, uh, uh, who was from my area and who unfortunately is no longer living, uh, and people like Pete Peters and Art Telser and Susan Catania, um, serious, really classy legislators. And uh, that was important, I think, not just to keep some semblance of, of uh, a two-party system alive in Chicago, but I think it was particularly important when it came time to uh, uh, for those the Republicans in the House, for example, to go into caucus. Because what it meant was that there were some intelligent, thoughtful, strong voices in the Republican ranks who could speak up for things that were genuinely and legitimately of uh, concern to the city of Chicago. And if you have a, a body made up entirely of either downstaters or Collar County uh, folks who don't experience the same thing that we do in the city of Chicago, you're not going to get that point of view. And so that was extremely important. Uh, by the same token, uh, the system made possible the election of really quality Democrats from the outlying area, from the uh, collar counties. People like Bill Redman, uh, who as a matter of fact was uh, Speaker of the House for a period of time. Uh, a marvelous person, um, uh, could never have been elected, uh, and in fact wasn't once uh, cumulative voting was um, uh, abo abolished. Someone like Glenn Schneider, um, someone like Harold Katz, uh, all really, again, outstanding, thoughtful, good legislators. And it meant there that when the Democrats in the House went into caucus, they had some suburbanites uh, who, who understood that there were different worlds, that the whole world didn't rise and set uh, in the city of Chicago. And that was important also. So you've got a very different um, perspective, at least, that was available to, uh, to each of the parties. I think there's, there's another thing, too, that, um, uh, that is part of what I was talking about, and that is the fact that uh, it 
does make it possible for any structured machine, any structured organization to be challenged. Uh, it does make it possible for those who are not part of the establishment to have an opportunity at least to run for office. And uh, that is good not only for the system as a whole, and it is good for the system that there are new people who come on board, uh, but it's good for the establishment because they don't get so complacent and ingrown. And that was part of, I think, what had happened in my own party. Uh, um, the thing that drove us crazy, though those of us who were independent Democrats, is that uh, and we were Democrats and we thought we should have an opportunity to um, participate and maybe even be listened to occasionally. But the Democratic Party then was just like a private club. It was all so ingrown. It was all dominated by the Chicago regulars. Well, the, the presence of cumulative voting uh, and, and uh, this unique system for Illinois made it possible uh, for them to be challenged. Uh, so that even in Chicago, uh, within the Democratic Party, which was obviously the dominant party, you got an Abner Mikva, you got a Bob Mann. Um, uh, up on the North Shore, you got a Bob Marks. Uh, uh, though things like that were happening too. And that was very, very important. Um, so I've um, now been on all sides of this question over a period of time. Uh, and I say that without any real embarrassment uh, because I've <coughs> Excuse me, let me go back to that. I've uh, been on all sides of this question, uh, I, which I freely admit uh, without any embarrassment, uh, because uh, it is important. Uh, the, you know, the structure of how you go about the elective process makes a lot of difference. It makes a huge amount of difference. And um, uh, it's not always a simple thing. So my own experience now tells me that we would benefit, and I mean all of us would benefit, if we went back to uh, some form of a multi-member um, cumulative voting system. One of the things that's fascinating, by the way, uh, in all of this is that, uh, because I do a little bit of writing about this subject in, in my law case book, and uh, so I, I began to notice that um, there are a lot of, uh, well, political theorists, uh, some legal scholars, who are beginning to say, why are we so hung up in this country on the sanctity of single member winner take all, uh, which is the sort of American system. Uh, you know, maybe that's not the best way to get really good representation. So there's some serious thinkers who are beginning to, um, uh, or maybe continuing to explore this question. Uh, and I think that's uh, very good too. And that, by the way, means more than just Lanny Guineer. Because uh, I freely admit she got sort of hung out to dry on that. Uh, uh, partly because of misrepresentation. I have to add one other thing, by the way. I grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio. Cincinnati, Ohio was the, uh, uh, the granddaddy or the grandmommy uh, uh, of uh, pure cumulative voting, really, proportional representation. Uh, a very interesting system in which you sort of voted, uh, when you're mem for members of the city council, you voted uh, you know, one, two, three, four, five, and um, I don't think I could even describe anymore how it got counted, but it was something like uh, once a candidate got um, the requisite number of number ones, then anyone else who voted number one for that candidate, uh, that it was no longer needed, so it would go to the second person. Anyway, it was pure proportional representation. So I sort of grew up with the idea. Um, that uh, it was uh, identified with reform because it went in to Cincinnati uh, as a reform measure to get rid of what had been one of the most corrupt city governments uh, anywhere. Did uh, in Cincinnati did proportional representation help elect reform-minded people? Oh yes, there's no question about that. The um, uh, Actually, at the time I was growing up in Cincinnati, I think this has now changed again, there, there was no Democratic Party locally. There were Republicans and there were Charterites. And the Charterites were really the, uh, uh, the, the uh, if you will, heirs of those who had reformed the structure of Cincinnati government and instituted proportional representation. Um, that was back in, if I remember correctly, in the early 1920s or mid-1920s, um, associated with a man whose name is still legend in political science circles, Murray Seasongood, um, who 
who was a, a, a very much a part of that movement. And, um, and so PR, as it was known, uh, proportional representation, was a part of that reform movement. And it also made it possible for uh, members of the Charterite Party locally to be elected, uh, often in a majority, in fact, typically in a majority until in later years. And so people like members of the Taft family, and the Tafts were uh, sort of the, the political royalty of Cincinnati, if you will, uh, were Charterites locally. Charles Taft um, was elected as a member of the city council and I think served several terms as mayor, if I'm not mistaken, uh, not as a Republican, but as a Charterite. Hmm. So yes, it did, it was very much identified with um, uh, the reform movement and with those who were in fact the reformers. Just a couple of things. Does my, does this show? Not at all. Okay. You know that little, sorry. What am I doing? Just the comes tip out. of it, we want to keep in the, the blue. It's like being a candidate again, for <laughs> heaven's sake. <laughs> Precisely like being a candidate. <laughs> Bring the handlers in. <laughs> I'm recording. So let's um, <clears throat> talk about the drawbacks of cumulative voting. Well, one of the things that clearly was a drawback was that uh, in addition to uh, making possible some of these star legislators, it also made possible uh, some who should not have been there in the first place and often preserved them in office in perpetuity. Probably the most famous uh, or infamous, if you will, was a group called the West Side Bloc, uh, who were uh, ostensibly Republicans elected because of bullet voting and cumulative voting. Uh, from districts in Chicago who were often said to be or thought to be associated with um, uh, you know, the um, syndicate or whatever we chose to call it in those days. And, um, and there was no way to get rid of them because of that system. Uh, I'd also, at the time I was studying this as a constitutional convention delegate, had looked at some of the downstate districts. And there were a number of them where uh, people were sort of preserved in office for long, long periods of time who clearly had lost interest in the process if they ever had any and uh, weren't doing anything and were just sort of there to be uh, uh, productive, not, I'm sorry, not to be productive, but uh, to be uh, disciplined, uh, available votes when needed. And that's not good, obviously, for the process. Now, one of the reasons, though, why I think all of that was able to happen and why I don't think it's inevitable that it be repeated is that the legislature had passed um, a statute which allowed the, the parties, and basically we're still talking about the major, two major parties, to uh, determine through their party mechanism how many they were going to nominate for the state house from each legislative district. And while the pattern was not uh, absolutely universal throughout the state, the most common form was that the majority party in a district would nominate two because it could elect two, and the minority party would nominate one because that's all it could elect. And now, if you're faced with electing three members to the House from a district and there are only three candidates, there's not a heck of a lot of choice. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and that clearly was one of the things that, uh, uh, that made the system really work not happily uh, uh, leading up to the convention. Now, there's absolutely no reason why the legislature would, would or should pass a statute like that again, and I don't think it would. I think one of the things that has happened in the intervening years is that the, um, uh, the idea that the political parties could, uh, uh, could, and I'll use the word manipulate the process uh, that well, I think would just not be tolerated. So I, th I think our chances of um, it, saying, assuming we could put that whole system back exactly as it was before, and I'm not assuming it would go back exactly the same, but assuming we did put it back exactly as we had before, um, I don't think that the, the disadvantages of um, multi-member cumulative voting districts uh, would be the same as they were in the old days. At least that's my best judgment. And I'm sure that, that many of us who uh, had experienced it, if there are any of us left, <laughs> would, um, uh, would make every effort to make sure that that did not happen. So hopefully we would get what I consider to be the advantage of this unique system we had without 
uh, necessarily the uh, the disadvantage. And so I'm clear, the main disadvantage is because the state allowed the parties to restrict how many they would nominate. If in the, if parties couldn't restrict the number of nominations, the disadvantage wouldn't nearly be as great. It would not be as great. Now, I don't mean to suggest that it would not be there at all, because you are still likely to have uh, the vast majority of districts in which there is a majority party and a minority party. And uh, so that even if they uh, nominated larger numbers, uh, the chances are there would be two elected from the majority and one from the minority. Uh, but if, if the parties didn't restrict how many could run, you would still have some competition going on at least uh, at the primary level within the two parties and maybe even from time to time at uh, the general election level. Have you found after the cutback that there are many elections where now instead of having only three people on the ballot for three races, there's only one name on the ballot for one representative to be elected? Um, well, there's a l very little competition these days. Uh, if that was the nature of your question. Um, one of the arguments that was made by the, the principal and loudest advocate for um, going back to, a sing or going to single member districts when it was actually passed in the 1980s uh, was that it would increase competition for House seats. That has clearly not been the case. Um, I haven't done the studies, but I believe there are those who have done studies uh, which have shown that, if anything, there probably is less competition now than there was before, um, which is, is not a healthy factor uh, at all. Could you talk a bit more about the 1980 campaign? Well, it was, um, you mean to the one that put it on the ballot and, um, yeah, it was, in some ways it was too bad, even for those who were single member district advocates. Uh, I think it was uh, an unfortunate set of circumstances because the groups that had been advocating that position for a long time, groups like the League of Women Voters, uh, who took that position in good faith, who uh, felt it, it would m produce a better legislature and obviously had no political axe to grind in that respect, uh, were sort of shunted to the side. And um, the campaign was taken over by uh, and I won't regret saying this anymore, the demagogues. Uh, uh, the whole campaign was on the basis of um, we're going to cut back. It had nothing to do with the, really the system of voting, you know, this cumulative voting system. It said this proposal will allow us to cut back the House by one-third and we'll get rid of one-third of those slimy, no good, uh, corrupt, et cetera, uh, legislators. And um, I'm afraid that is the basis on which it got uh, pri sold primarily. And for those of us who had mixed feelings about it, and I think probably I, uh, by in 1980, I was still, I had some mixed feelings about it. Um, uh, it was really extremely unfortunate because it, it got adopted, um, uh, an idea that was perfectly sound, uh, uh, got adopted for all the wrong reasons. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, it has not produced what it was supposed to produce. Uh, it has not produced more diversity. Uh, it has uh, no question in my mind, and this is having been a legislator, uh, and I like to think a student of the process at the same time, um, is that it, uh, it helped to contribute, helped enormously to contribute to the way the House is today. Uh, the House now is about the way the Senate was when I first went into the Senate. Um, it is controlled. Um, some, you talked to numerous individual members and uh, they will say we might not as well we might as well not be here uh, the the two leaders the speaker of the house and the minority leader um, the uh, decide what is what and what is not what and that's the way it goes and one reason why is because they do have control of these districts um, and uh, control of who is is going to win primaries uh, now, some of that, of course, has to do with the dominance of money also, which has changed dramatically. But those two things are not uh, unrelated to one another. And um, uh, the House is uh, just, I don't think it's any fun anymore for anyone who is there. And I hear them saying that over and over and over again. And that's unfortunate. It really is very unfortunate. Um, it's not good for the legislative process. Talk a bit more about what the House is like after the cutback amendment character of the House and the results of that. 
after the Cutback Amendment. Yes. Um, what was the House like? Well, it, it became um, increasingly less flexible, less creative, um, more disciplined, more controlled. The, um, I, I'll tell you one little, if I may, vignette, which you may not want to use. I was in the Senate, which is, you know, kind of mean place in those early days, and um, uh, there was some issue that was of great importance to the Chicago regular Democrats. And um, uh, they had passed it, I think, out of the House, and they were trying to um, uh, get it in the Senate. And of course, I had my group of crazy eights, uh, eight of us who were independent Democrats, and they were having trouble with us. Um, and um, so they took uh, uh, one of our members, um, uh, Bill Morris, who was later became mayor of Waukegan and is now in the private sector, uh, over, and they were sort of giving in the, the business, uh, uh, the leadership of the House. And, um, and he said in his usually typical colorful way, um, you know, why should we do anything, you know, you guys want us to do because all they do, uh, the regular Democrats, uh, is just dump on us. Now, his language was much different from that, but that's the idea. And, um, and the leadership uh, of the House at that time, Chicago leadership, said, what? You mean they, they, don't even, they never let you pass any of your own bills or anything? He said, we let our guys do that over here. Uh, it's just that, you know, once in a while when it's uh, you know, extremely important. Well, and the reason why was in order to have Democrats from independent uh, or suburban districts, they had to let them uh, go their own way um, on most issues, unless it was something that was really of you know, rock bottom importance to the city of Chicago. And um, I'm not sure that that happens anymore. Uh, it's, um, it was just, it was a very different atmosphere. And you've got all these people who were so much more creative uh, because they could go do things on their own. You know, the, the Abner Mikvas, the, uh, uh, with the Roy Sandquists on the Republican side. Uh, the, the Bob Manns, the, uh, the Woody Bowmans, et cetera, um, were all able to do um, much more interesting things as legislators. And I, you, just, you don't sense as much. I don't mean that nobody down there is able to, um, uh, you know, to do his or her own thing. Uh, but the atmosphere is quite different. And it's not just my observation of that. It's what many of the members themselves will say about it. Um, perhaps you could talk a bit more about some of the things that independents were able to do in the old house, and a bit more about the atmosphere of the old house. Well, I, I think the idea was that they were just able to be much more creative and independent because they, uh, uh, in many cases, they, well, not in many, but in some cases, they were actually there uh, over the uh, opposition of those who controlled the party. And by the way, this was not true just on the Democratic side, uh, but there were there are places in uh, this state that are controlled by a Republican machine to the same extent as the Democrats were controlled by a Democratic machine in those days. Uh, and let's take a look at DuPage County, for example. Um, so there were, there were legislators who were um, uh, their own person, really, and uh, uh, were able to uh, to do, uh, all right, case in point might be something like um, uh, election reform uh, matters, which you were never going to get out of uh, the regular mechanism on either side. Um, I may not be able to remember all of the things that we did in those days. Um, uh, I can remember one that was an issue for a while, was just extending the hours for voting. Um, now, eventually, I think the, uh, uh, the Democratic Party itself took that up as an issue. But as I recall, in the earliest days, that was not true. Um, and um, so, but you could get independent Democrats and independent Republicans uh, more in the House than in the Senate uh, who were able to, uh, uh, to put together packages like that. Um, there, uh, just hold a minute, I'm trying to think. There was one something else. Yeah. Maybe changing the, oh, I know some, a couple of other things, by the way. Um, now, this, this is not something that would grab the hearts of uh, all taxpayers in the state. 
Uh, but if you're going to be a, a good legislator and reach out to your constituents, you have to have a presence in your district, an office in your district uh, where people can come in and, and be served. Um, and so the idea of having an allowance for that office was extremely important to uh, those of us who were outside of the establishment. It was not important to the establishment legislators because in Chicago, for example, most of them uh, operated out of the ward office. Uh, and so they didn't need an allowance to have an independent freestanding office. Um, and to some extent, that was true for some of the uh, suburban Republicans. So that was always one of the battles on which uh, the fact that there were independents who wanted to be able to serve their constituents and who didn't have ties to the ward organization uh, could, you know, come together. And uh, we weren't always successful, but um, sometimes we're able to do that. For a while, with the exception of maybe a couple of people, the idea of moving the primary was one of those kinds of issues, too. Um, some of us who were maybe a little paranoid uh, always thought that one reason why we had such an early primary in Illinois was that it made it very difficult uh, to challenge the establishment uh, because it meant that the campaigning took place in the two worst months of the year, January and February, uh, and decisions had to be made so far in advance because the filing date was in December, uh, which was you know more than a year before the election, really. Um, and so we wanted to move the uh, primary for that and, and other reasons as well. And uh, with rare exceptions, Phil Rock being one, by the way, who was always, as I recall, uh, in favor of a moving the primary to September. But apart from someone like Phil Rock, it was a di an issue on which uh, the independents could come together, um, but um, it didn't have much support from elsewhere. So yes, there were, there were issues on which it made a difference. <coughs> more really. Good. Forgetting something. <laughs> I'll bug, bug him for some more. Um, yeah. Um, why were the regulars in Chicago so strongly for cumulative voting in 1970? You know, I'm just asking myself that question. I'm trying to think. Um, I suppose it's because they thought they could control the, the system most of the time. Um, they certainly could, in most districts in Chicago, they could control it, but not everywhere. I mean, uh, the, the, what Republicans got elected um, uh, in, in some of the peripheral districts, they controlled. Now, they didn't when you get into some of the lakefront districts, for example. Um, I would have to sort of go back and refresh my recollection on that. It was funny, when we started talking about it, I kept saying, why is it that they were so um, um, strongly for it? Yeah. And I'm not sure that I uh, have a clear reading on that at the moment. Sure. Maybe it's because it was a system they were used to, and they basically knew, for the most part, they knew how to control it. Mm -hmm. um, I guess um, I'd ask whether, how you think the Illinois experience might fit into a you know, students of democracy, you know, what somebody thinking about democracy might think about if they look at Illinois' use of cumulative voting broadly. Well, I think probably if, if students were to, to um, uh, students of democracy were to look at how we go about selecting members of uh, the legislature, uh, they, uh, Illinois' experience was so unique, our system was so unique, uh, that it helped to draw out both the, the pluses and the minuses, if you will, of that system. But I think the main thing is it provides an opportunity, just the fact that this issue is being raised again, provides an opportunity for students to stop and think, what is the best way to get the, uh, the fairest representation of uh, cons a constituency that is so wildly diverse? Uh, as is true not just in the state of Illinois, but really in this country. Uh, we have so many different uh, groups, you know, racial, ethnic, uh, ge geographic, uh, economic, everything else. Um, and, and what you're looking for is a legislature that, uh, that is both representative and responsible at the same time. 
And uh, I, I think the latter is extremely important. Uh, um, I don't want a legislature that is so representative uh, that all it does, all the members do is to hold the finger up to the wind and see which way it's blowing to decide what they're supposed to do. But they've got to be both uh, representative and responsible. Uh, and that means thoughtful and creative and sort of looking long term, uh, which is the hardest thing in the world. That's probably the worst part of American politics today. It is so bottom line, uh, uh, quick fix, short sighted. And um, uh, we've got to find ways in which we can uh, get back to legislators who can uh, take a somewhat longer view of things. And um, uh, how we go about the election process, that is the structure of it, uh, obviously can have an effect on that. Um, I don't know that I'm right that we would be better off by going back to some form of um, multi-member districts slash commutative voting. My own judgment, having observed this process for a long period of time now, is that we would be better off. Uh, that we would get a higher quality, if you will, of uh, legislative performance. And, uh, uh, but in any event, people ought to stop and think about it. Dan, I'll give you the chance to say anything else you'd like to say. And if nothing, then... No. Well, <coughs> anyway, just one little thing that I want uh, to the, the question is, if we decided this was the best thing to do, how do we go about uh, bringing it about? And I'm not sure I know the answer to that question. Uh, I have a feeling that this is one on which a lot of grassroots work has got to be done first. Uh, I think it is not too likely to come from the top down, uh, which means that um, um, a lot of discussion in community meetings and church groups uh, on um, uh, cable television, uh, uh, whatever, uh, and trying to get those who are running for office to talk about it, not as a um, a litmus test uh, uh, kind of issue, you know, like abortion, you're either for or against it, and you know, that, you know, the whole election turns on that. Uh, but to get people asking about it so that there can be some sort of thoughtful comments about it before people feel that, uh, uh, that it is a, a blood oath or a litmus test. Um, so I think that is one thing that does have to happen. I, I just don't sense that it's likely to just suddenly appear. I think obviously the fact that there are groups out there now um, who are uh, committed to it, uh, who are convinced it is the right way to go, can help to bring about some of that discussion and can help to bring about some of that advocacy also. Um, I think there ought to be an effort to, um, uh, to get it involved in, in more in some of the uh, legislative, state legislative debates um, uh, and certainly in places like, you know, gubernatorial debates. Uh, um, it's not going to be the, the cutting edge issue for a while, but uh, I think most people don't even know that there, that there is an issue out there like this, and I think that's one of the things that needs to be done, is to just get it out there uh, on, um, to use one of the expressions, the front burner. Um, and, um, and then I would think it would also be helpful to um, perhaps to do some work with um, editorial boards um, and uh, get them thinking about it again. Uh, most of the major papers, at least, I don't know about the television stations, certainly had strong positions on it uh, in 1970. They probably can't even remember what their positions are today, <laughs> but, uh, um, but I think that would be an, um, another way to begin to uh, you know, develop some uh, discussion about it. Great. It, I don't think it's a partisan issue, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there, it cut across party lines in 1970 when we had this issue before us. Um, and uh, my guess is today, if anything, it might cut across party lines even more than it did then. And if so, that's good, because that means it doesn't become a you know, be-all or end-all for, uh, for one party or the other. What a wonderful gem at the end. <laughs>